North Korea is sometimes called the land of whispers. People don't say things out in the open. They generally whisper to each other and they quickly walk away. It's one of the most secretive places on Earth. It's one of the most isolated countries on Earth. And as a visitor, you very much experience the same reality. You're never shown the whole picture, you're never told the whole story, all you get are blurry shadows, all you get are quiet whispers, and it's up to you to figure out what is honesty, and what is fear, what is truth, and what are lies, and what's reality, and what's complete and pure propaganda. One of my friends had gone to North Korea and she was very shaken up by her experience. North Korea was crazy. It was probably one of the most exotic places I've ever been in my life. And it completely changed the way I think about the world. It changed the way I think about governance. It changed the way I think about society. It just changed the way I think about people can live their lives. I was fascinated. I wanted to know more. So I went online. I tried to find more information about North Korea, but there isn't a whole lot of fresh material out there. What I found was generally Western produced, one-sided, and quite often it seemed simply uneducated. In October 2000, the president sends his secretary of state, Madeleine Albright, to Pyongyang for direct talks with Kim Jong-il. I went, having been briefed on what kind of a weirdo he was from our own people. He was portrayed as reclusive-like, uh, with many girlfriends and uh, watching porno movies, and basically a very weird kind of person that you had no idea what he was going to be like. I had always been interested in the Soviet times and propaganda, art and architecture, and simply in mysterious, out of the way places, so I wanted to go. But I did not want to go as a typical tourist. I wanted to do something meaningful. After exchanging a bunch of emails with the company running tours to North Korea, I was given a rare permission to bring my camera and to film video. I was to shoot a very small travel promo for the company and I was allowed to use the rest of my footage to put together a project of my own. Most people seem to think that travel to Korea is impossible or at least very difficult. But the truth is that it's actually very easy. All I had to do is email a copy of my passport to the company and they took care of everything else from there. The downside of it is that you have to travel with a group. Unfortunately, it's the only feasible way to enter North Korea. Well, that's what I had to do. My trip began in Vietnam, in one of my favorite cities in my beautiful thousand-year-old Hanoi. From here, I took an overnight train to Nanning and then later Beijing in China. Up over there somewhere, I can't see. He's actually filming, not ah. <laughs> Finally, I was ready to board my train to Pyongyang. At the station, I met my Western tour leader. Are we picking up this mic? The wind's not gonna be a problem, is it? I got on my train, everybody's excited because we're going to North Korea, and then the train moves, and suddenly, panic breaks out. And I look out the window, and it turns out a man was left on the platform. Now, had this been a foreign tourist? Well, it's his fault for missing the train. He's gonna have to catch the next one. But being a Korean man, I can't help but wonder. What's gonna happen to this guy when this train actually arrives in Pyongyang and he's not on it? It's dramatic. Later that night, I got to talk to another Korean man and he told me that the guy had left all his things on the train. The guy seemed to think that his brother, as he called him, 
was gonna go to the North Korean embassy in Beijing and was gonna get help from them. Yeah, I think he would, he, he would either take a flight or he would take the express train. I asked him, is your brother gonna get in trouble? Is he gonna get punished? He'll be okay. I don't know. The guy told me, well, he's not gonna get punished, he's gonna get criticized. Now, what does criticized mean? We're going to North Korea. This is Modern Bong Band. It's the new band that apparently Kim Jong Un handpicked. The border crossing is basically a river. On one side it's China and the other side it's Korea. On the Chinese side, you see commercialism, you see tall buildings, you see some advertising, and then you cross the river to the Korean side, and there's some people wandering around the river. There's, there's nothing there, really. And then the train pulls up to the customs office, I guess, to some kind of a building. And the excitement died down pretty quickly because for the next three hours, nothing really happened. And after a pretty typical luggage check, the train slowly moved again. And I was in the DPRK, country 33, North Korea. It's the evening, I arrived in Pyongyang, and I get to meet my tour guides. Long live the glorious Bokos patch of Korea. Long live the great leader, current Kim Jong-un. President Kim Il-sung and theory leader Kim Jong-il will always be with us. And then in front you can see the party foundation monument. You can see the you're not cold? <laughs> I went up to the tour guides, I introduced myself, they didn't want to be friendly, they wanted no interaction. Instead, they presented me with a number of rules to abide by when visiting their country. In our country you have to do this, in our country you cannot do this. In their country, I am not allowed to take video, I am not allowed to take pictures of the local people because they will be angry with me and I will get in trouble. Okay. In their country, if I read a newspaper which has a picture of Kim Jong-il, Kim Il-sung, Kim Jong-un, I am not allowed to fold that newspaper in half, I am not allowed to crumble it, I am not allowed to disrespect it in absolutely any way. And by the way, Every single newspaper has pictures of their dear leaders over every single page. 
when photographing any statues or any monuments to the dear leaders, you always have to shoot them from a low angle point of view. You always have to shoot the whole image. You shouldn't cut off the shoulder. You shouldn't cut off the shoes. You shouldn't cut off anything at all. Now that I abide by all of those rules, well, within reason, I really feel that I had done enough not to truthfully offend anybody, yet to stay true to myself. I was to stay at the Yangakto Hotel, and I was told that Yangakto means the Horned Sheep Island. So, I suppose I was staying at the Horned Sheep Island Hotel. The Yangakto is a 50-story building with a revolving restaurant on top. It's located on a small, isolated island in the middle of Pyongyang. I was put on floor 26. All the floors below 26, all the floors above 26, they're completely empty. All the lights are turned off, there's nobody there. The restaurant on top, empty. There's a casino down in the basement, there's some karaoke rooms, there's apparently a spa, a swimming pool, several different restaurants, nobody there. Completely empty. And one more thing, at the Yangakto Hotel, floor number five is missing. There is no access to floor number four or floor number six either. What is on those floors? Nobody knows. The next morning I got up pretty early and I headed up to the airport for my flight up to Mount Pekdu, which is the mythical birthplace of the dear leader, comrade Kim Jong-il. Air Koryo, the North Korean national airline, is infamous for apparently being the worst airline in the world. The flight was really nothing special, but then again, I flight American before, I flight United before, they suck. Air Koryo was not worse. It wasn't better, but it also wasn't worse. And they had no extra luggage fees. Ancestral Mount Bandu, symbol of Korea and cradle of the Korean nation, honored with its 5,000 year long history, was chanted in the hearts of the Korean people since Kim Il sung started the armed struggle against the Japanese imperialists in the forests of the mountain. From the base of Mount Pekdu, where the bus parking was, to the top where you could see the iconic uh, Heaven Lake, it was actually quite a bit of a trek. Everybody went at their own pace and, well, I separated from the tour guides. Once I got to the top, I set up a time-lapse shot over the lake. But suddenly this angry Korean guy shows up and he demands that I move my camera. Apparently it's in his way. Well, I bought myself some three minutes trying to reason with him, but eventually I had to cut it short. I walked away, I asked somebody for a picture, and out of nowhere, left and right, everybody wants to take pictures together. And before I knew it, the grumpy guy shows up, he pushes everybody aside, and now he insists on taking a picture together as well. Then the tour guide showed up, and it was pretty much the end of local interaction. From Mount Pekdu, I head over to the secret camp. This is the historic place where our great leader Kim Jong Il was born and spent his childhood. So that picture shows our present Kim Il Sung and then the mother Kim Jong Su, and then the, our great leader Kim Jong Il at the age of the one years old. And then you can see over there the Jong Il Peak. Jong Il is the name of our great leader Kim Jong Il. 
Half the things, half the places have been named after the dear leaders. That area is very that mysterious area. There are mountains named after the dear leaders. There are trees named after the dear leaders. There is a flower named after the dear leader in Korea. So that is a poem written by a present Kim Il Sung. And then the, that is a, a signature of our present Kim Il Sung. According to old documents, Kim Jong-il was actually born in Russia. However, in Korea, the story involves double rainbows and talking birds. Throughout my whole visit there, I really could not help but wonder, how are all those people gonna feel when one day they find out the truth? Since the beginning of the trip, I had been waiting for some kind of a local experience. I was stuck in a train and I was thinking, well, when I get to Pyongyang, the trip is finally gonna start. Then I arrive in Pyongyang and well, I'm stuck in the hotel. The next morning, I'm thinking that's when things are gonna happen, but no, I get ushered to a bus, I get put on a plane and I am constantly sheltered. That's the point when I figure out that this local experience, well, it's simply not gonna come. But I walk up to Mr. Mo and I ask him, Mr. Mo, can you tell me a little bit about your life? Mm-mm. Miss Selma, can you tell me a little bit about your government? Absolutely not. And at that point, I come to my second realization that those two, they're not really tour guides. They're simply propaganda speakers. They're there to escort me from one place to another to give it the impression of a well-rounded trip when in fact, they can't wait for me to just leave. As my final attempt, I walked up to Mr. Jim and I asked, Mr. Jim, can you tell me anything about your Juchi ideology? And to my great surprise, he actually really lit up. He was very happy that I asked. His answer did not make a whole lot of sense. A lot of their propaganda, a lot of their ideology does not make a whole lot of sense to me. And if I had to guess, most Koreans probably can't follow it either. And without pushing, I asked him, well, do you really believe that this ideology translates to the people? Do you really think that all Koreans can accomplish anything they dream of? He simply didn't have an answer for me. And by that point, we were back at the bus and our conversation kind of ended. The hotel that evening really reminded me of Stanley Kubrick's Shining. It was deserted, it was in the middle of nowhere, and it felt as if nobody has been there in ages. And I really wondered, do the staff of this hotel, do they come to work every day, even when there is no tourist, and do they still pretend that it's business as usual? Then I got to my room, and I turned on the TV. I had the TV running for that evening. I wanted a local experience and I very much got one. I was, I was sitting in this crappy hotel room with no hot water, with old stinky carpets, with black and white images and revolutionary music blasting from the TV. And I simply felt transported to some strange other reality. If this is the Western luxury that you show off to foreigners, what kind of conditions do the locals actually live in? That evening was spent drinking blueberry wine in the hotel's hallway. What I found more interesting though was the cute waitress and the fact that she was completely mesmerized by the touch screen on another tourist's tablet. She spent most of the evening playing Angry Birds until suddenly Mr. Mo showed up. He sent the poor girl away and he started playing the game himself. In July 4th, 1976, dear leader Kim Jong-il came here and set a place where we can build this monument. All the Korean people called President Kim Il-sung as a tiger of the mountains. So we have to build this monument as a very young aspect of the President Kim Il-sung. After learning all about the height, weight and density of the Dear Leader statue and visiting a museum dedicated to the Dear Leaders, I headed up to the airport for my flight to Chongjin. <laughs> 
형이 이건 나갔더니 나 지금 공부들이 나를 불러싸게 지요 바른 넘 소녀 동무 노래 하나 불러줘 부끄러워 하나 불렀지요 나를 넘긴 봄나리를 나를 넘긴 봄나리를 너를 강변 봄나리를 나를 강변 봄나리를 너를 강변 봄나리를 If there's one image that stuck with me from Chongjin, it has to be the factories. This is the main city for the heavy industry. There are many metal complex and many chemical complex here. And also there are many military bases. Every time when we open the factory, the troop leaders come here. Not to support the military base, only to improve the people's life. Two leaders visit here more than 50 times. The warm guidance of the President Kim Il-sung and dear leader Kim Jong-il, this city become modern city. After some six-hour journey, I was taken to the apparent highlight of the modern city Chongjin, the Fisherman's Club. It was basically a gated building with a karaoke room, with a pool table, with beer, and with very little else. I was told that I had about three hours to kill there. After this one's on the yeah, I think. Quick, finish this beer, then go to the hotel quickly, and check in, shower, and drink hotel. It's better. I was not allowed to wander, but I could go out to the courtyard. And it turns out that the foreigners' presence sparked um, quite a bit of interest from the local people, especially from the kids. Many of the children, they came up, they poked their faces through the gate, they tried to see better, and I waved to some of them, some of them smiled, some of them got shy, and understandingly so, they were very curious. After all, they may have never seen foreigners before. With the street blocked off by fences, I tried to shoot some images through the cracks with a longer lens, but within seconds, Selma showed up. She was more angry than ever before, and she claimed that the locals came to her and that they told on me. She claimed that they were very angry with me, and basically, I'm in big trouble. I walked into my room, I looked through the window, and I got quite excited. I could actually see the life of the local Koreans from much closer than at any other point since the start of the trip. Later I was told that with no other hotels in town, the tour guides had no choice but to bring foreigners to the very center, to a place surrounded by locals. But after my earlier encounter with Selma, now I feel quite paranoid, and I keep wondering, even without the tour guides around, will the locals see me, will they genuinely tell on me, and will I really get in trouble for filming? Although feeling a bit stiff, the dinner performance from the waitresses was a nice accent to end the day. Um, their guitar was missing strings, it was completely out of tune, but they made up for it with their smiles. <laughs> Thank you.
After dinner, Jim came up to me and he asked me if I was satisfied with his earlier answer about the Juchi ideology. It was pretty obvious he wanted to talk more. I told him a bit about my travels, I told him what I knew about South Korea. Suddenly I'm getting nervous looks from the Western tour leader, he wants me to shut my mouth, but well, I kind of ignored him. And I told Jim that I didn't think North Korea was a really happy place for its people. Maybe I went too far, but Jim listened. Later, I also asked him if the DPRK considers North and South Korea as one country, why would the North bomb the southern Yongping Island? Why would they risk hurting their own brothers? Shells raining down on the island of Yongpyong, marking the first artillery strike on South Korean soil in more than half a century. As the plumes of smoke billowed from the tiny island community, Seoul lifted the state of military readiness to its highest level short of war. Firing in response to the hail of some 200 shells from the north, South Korea scrambled F-16 fighters to the scene. The exchange lasted about an hour. Up to 70 houses and other structures were set alight by North Korean artillery shells, forcing residents to evacuate to underground bunkers. Jim told me it was a distortion by the Western media. He told me it was a retaliation attack and that it targeted only a military base on the southern island. I did some research later on and, well, he wasn't exactly wrong. Suddenly, Mo stormed in. He accused me of being a two-faced spy and an undercover journalist. I asked him to share his honest thoughts, but unfortunately, he wasn't willing to do that. Should the South Korean puppet group dare intrude into the territorial waters of the DPRK, even one hundredth of a millimeter, the revolutionary armed forces of the DPRK will continue taking merciless military counteractions against it. The truth is, you do have to be a bit two-faced in North Korea. In my eyes, so many things are so twisted, straight, wrong, and terribly evil. However, for most people, whether it's genuine or as a result of heavy indoctrination, they really believe all of it to be true. So even feeling so much anger towards their leaders, I recognize that only by respecting what they believe in can I expect them to open up to me. Then the power cut out. In the morning, I visited another monument to, surprise, surprise, the President Kim Il-sung. Somebody asked, well, with all the problems that your country is facing, why do the leaders waste money and resources? Why do they put up statues to themselves? President Kim Il-sung and the leader Kim Jong-il received the best thing only for the people, not for them. I mean, the good life and good health, best thing. The great leaders are completely selfless. They only care about the people. Kim Il-sung was a shy man. He didn't want the statue. But the people begged him so much that he finally agreed. The statue used to be hollow, but apparently the people felt that it wasn't a strong enough expression of love. Uh, why did they decide to uh, fill the inside and make solid? Four or five year old, those children were much better than most adult professionals I had seen. And it was just the beginning.
By that time in the trip, I worked out my best strategy for filming. I had to stay as far away as possible from Mo and Selma, and I tried to hang around Mr. Jim, who was really quite friendly and supportive. On the way back to Pyongyang, perhaps to further discourage my filming, Mo announced that he will never bring another tourist to the area. He then started bragging about harassing other visitors with cameras. One day I organized undercover yeah. terrorists. Yeah. I, me and my driver broke. Break. The journalist camera. <laughs> <laughs> you hate the journalist so much? He almost oh, did opened the window. Oh, no. Was that the video? Oh, oh they broke it. it. I thought you broke it. Yeah. Oh, thank God. Then after the video, now. Okay, I, okay. I promise with the driver, if I touch your shot, please stop the fast <laughs> very suddenly. <laughs> so I, psh, Enough of that. And then Enough. the journalist <laughs> dropped their camera to the road. Ooh. So you, I like it. You <laughs> Why would you like that? That's terrible. Later on, he decided to sing for the group. Today is the national holiday. This is a very significant day when the dear leader Kim Jong Il start the Songun policy. Songun means army forced policy. To celebrate the Songun holiday, I had lunch at one of the most unique restaurants in North Korea. It's only fast food joint. Deserted and possibly the only place in the world without Coca-Cola, it was otherwise pretty typical. Afterwards, I headed to the bowling alley where, after some encouragement from the Western tour leader, Mo finally agreed to give me an audio bit to the camera. Normal people, every people, walking news, students, even the old people for the exercise come here to play the ball. Walking back to the bus, I noticed a grocery store. Nothing special, except all the shelves are empty and the fruit on display is made from plastic. Apparently, it's decoration and I'm not allowed to film. Then came yet another 70s film set. A massive health and spa center equipped with a surreal Jetson style barber shop. Gloria, oh dear, I can't let her see me looking like this. Distracted, I wandered away and I spent a half hour exploring the hallways of this several story building before catching up with the tour guides by the Olympic sized swimming pool built for the people by the gracious leaders of the DPRK. As a little treat, I was taken for a ride on the Pyongyang metro, including some stations not usually open to visitors. I stuck to my strategy of hanging around Jim and trying to avoid the other guys. What I didn't consider is that by doing so, I may actually get Jim in trouble.
Before the day's highlight, I took a stop at the mass dance, a celebration for the Songun holiday. Jim had told me even more about the Korean culture and he agreed to give me an on-camera interview about his country and about the performance I was to see that evening. But only seconds later I'm getting on the bus and Jim suddenly gets pulled away. He's told that he's needed somewhere else and I'm told that he's not gonna be with the group this evening. Whether a coincidence or a planned intervention at the hands of the senior guides, I can only speculate. But by this point in the trip, even the most paranoid scenario seems eerily possible. That evening I was to experience the Guinness world record winning North Korean dance and acrobatics extravaganza and the key highlight for most visitors, the Arirang Games. What the Arirang performance lacked in resources, they certainly made up in creativity and a huge number of performers. 20,000 uh, showing the backdrop and 80,000 uh, performers. 80,000 people in the performance? Wow. 20,000 for the backdrop. Total, totally, all together is 100,000 people will join them.
Before reaching Wonson, I stopped by a collective farm in the region. 1,003 people are living in this farm and among of them, 800 people are engaging in the farm. I was no longer surprised when the farm looked nothing like any other ones I saw on the way. The chemistry teaches us we are not allowed to walk by only hand. We have to use the machines. From the bus earlier, I saw many destroyed crops, but here the fields look perfectly green and healthy. I wasn't sure if this excursion had any tourism value at all, and I found it quite difficult to believe that this farm was a typical one. I did, however, learn the story behind why number three is the lucky number in Korea. The French chemist um, asked the officers, can you guess how many persimmons are in these trees? The, the officer said, 500 persimmons are in this tree. At the time, President Kim Sung laughed. Why you said only 500? The French chemist um, said 800. So after President Kim Sung left, all the farmers take out the persimmons from this tree and then count how, how many persimmons are in this tree. So exactly 803. So, Korean people just think the three, three, number three is the lucky, like an, as in Western, lucky, lucky number seven. seven, but Koreans think number three is a lucky number, so 800 and then three, three means three lucky ones. <laughs> After visiting a local school, which thankfully was much more subtle than Chongjin, I continued on to the beach town of Wonson. I love traveling to unknown to undeveloped spots, yet in this case, I really hope that I can come back and see this city thriving and the people's lives improving. Tourism could make that happen, but only if the restrictions on the people were lifted. I tried to get a shot of a fisherman at sunset, and Mo pushed me too far. Come on, it's the sunset! I told him what I thought of his constant hostility, I told him what I thought of his constant harassment, and I told him that my friendliness could only go so far unless it's returned. After all, we had agreed I'd be filming, we had agreed that I'm filming parts of the video for them. Mo and Selma talked with each other in Korean, they were clearly uncomfortable, they were clearly embarrassed, and, well, I wasn't two-faced anymore. But that certainly escalated tension between us, and now I wondered if I'm gonna be restricted even more. I'm not sure how, but within 10 minutes, Mo's attitude changed completely. He suddenly became friendly, he invited everybody for seafood on the pier, and for the first time since the beginning of the trip, he was nice, he was open. In a subtle way, he also told me that allowing me to film may carry heavy consequences for him. I tried to imagine myself in his situation, and I tried to understand. After a morning game of beach volleyball, DPRK versus the Imperialists, my Korean experience was slowly coming. After lunch at the nearby Ulim waterfall, I got back on the bus and found another tourist explaining the concept of YouTube to Jim and Selma. He then showed them one of the most popular videos online. 
line which he pre-recorded beforehand. Jim wanted more and on the way back to Pyongyang he asked me for my mp3 player and the first thing he noticed is that the player was made in Korea. I was a little concerned that I hurt his pride but he wasn't hurt. I think it was just another seed that got planted somewhere in his mind. We all live in a yellow submarine, yellow submarine, yellow submarine. Jim listened to my player for the entire ride back to Pyongyang. He got scared when he put on a random Ramstein song, but otherwise he liked John Lennon. And I realized the North Koreans have never heard of the Beatles. They have never heard electronic music. They do not know Gangnam Style. Gangnam Style. They've never heard of the Dalai Lama and they don't know Shakespeare. They have no idea what modern cities such as, such as Tokyo, such as Dubai, or even Hong Kong look like. He also spent about two hours playing with what in my eyes is the absolutely most primitive drawing application. And it really touched me when I got home and I turned on my player and... And I saw this. And this. And this. In the afternoon, I filmed my final interview with the Western tour leader. It's good to exchange ideas, exchange uh, feelings and emotions with people. Everybody learns about each other, and that helps. Don't make him laugh, come on. <laughs> there was just one more mystery I felt I had to solve before leaving Korea. The fifth floor of the Yangakto. Throughout the trip I overheard that floor 5 is where the Korean guides stay under heavy surveillance to make sure that they don't get corrupt by western ideas. I noticed many Koreans getting on the elevator at floor 7, so I decided to go down to 7 and try to take the stairs to floor 5. While uncovering this mystery would serve as great closure to my film, sadly, I failed. Just as I got to the staircase, this Korean guy shows up and he wasn't gonna let me through. Instead of a confrontation, this time I decided to walk away. I guess that will give me one more reason. To free country more than the day I returned to Beijing from North Korea. I could cross the street without asking for permission, I could buy whatever I wanted, nobody seemed to care about my camera. Well, at least it seemed free until I looked up at the screen above. Before going to Korea, I expected the tour to show me how perfect and ideal their country is. I wanted the tour guides to indoctrinate me, to show me what a paradise Korea is, because I wanted to understand them better and I wanted to understand what they are taught. Instead, questions were not appreciated and answers were not given. 
The North Korean threat is, in my view, quite strongly overplayed. I don't think they're nearly as threatening as they uh, as they're made out to be. They're they're not really a rogue state. They're a, a very uh, threatened state. They feel very threatened by the United States, having war games every year with the South Koreans and with Japan. Uh, I think I think what they really want is to have all the um, to, to have a, a peace agreement, which goes back to uh, to the the armistice and erases that with a peace treaty and some some reassurances from the United States and from Western countries in general that they're not going to be attacked. It's a it's a very difficult country to live in. Uh, the, the the citizens have a terrible time, but it's made worse. It's exacerbated by uh, the embargo against them. I'm still unsure if visiting Korea was ethically right or not. People will tell you that money from tourism supports further abuses by the regime. But then again, does every single person really know what their tax money is used for in their home countries? And what's hard to comprehend is that North Korea is as far away from capitalism as humanly possible. I have no doubt that people have desires, that if given the chance they'd love to buy things, they'd love to have things. But there is nothing to buy. There is no concept of supply and demand. People do not earn real salaries. They earn rations in jobs they're assigned to. The Koreans, they're no different than other people in the world. What is different is that somewhere in their modern history, things went terribly wrong. The more they're threatened, the more they're like a porcupine. They'll put their quills out. And, and uh, when the South Koreans send up a three-stage missile, when the Japanese do, as they often do, is this regarded as a, a provocative action? It's, it's dual-use technology, just like the North Koreans. But it seems that North Korea is the North Korea is the country that cops the flak every time. And if if we were only less suspicious, if we could have some kind of uh, much more um, relaxed approach, a much more um, intelligent, careful approach towards North Korea, I think we'd find that those those quills would go down and as they have in the past demonstrated, they might become more cooperative. While Korea mostly gets negative attention, it's important to note that the people actually accomplished some pretty impressive feats. Pyongyang is quite futuristic. It's a future as imagined in the 70s, but it's unspoiled by neons, by LCD screens, by Starbucks logos. Arirang didn't use LCD screens, they had low resolution projectors, cheap LED effects and they had 20,000 performers flipping colored cards to form an image. And I thought, wow, if they can pull off a show like this with no technology, what could they do if they did have the resources of the West? I think if it only opened up a bit, North Korea could easily become one of the leading economies of the world. There'd be cheap, hard-working labor, there'd be a market for nearly any industry, the lives of the Koreans could improve, the country would develop rapidly. The sad downside is, if Korea does open up, will the people feel transported into the future? Will they be ready for the modern world having never used a computer before, having no reference point in terms of modern culture, music, film, having never heard of Wikipedia, iPhones or Google, and for most Koreans having never met a foreigner before. All I know is if Korea does open up, I'll do my best to be there the very next day to experience it firsthand. Professor Kim Il-sung teaches us our golden targets for our party is to build our country great, prosperous and powerful nation like heaven. So we have to build this strong country as soon as possible and hand it down to the next coming generation. Now